grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our special consideration this day is written for us in the book called The Acts of the Apostles in chapter 9, starting with verse 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was always doing good deeds and acts of charity. At that time, she became sick and died. After they had washed her, they laid her in an upstairs room. Since Lydda is near Joppa, when the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him who urged him, Come to us without delay. Peter got up and went with them. When he arrived, they led him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing him the robes and clothing Dorcas made while she was still with them. After Peter sent them all outside, he got down on his knees and prayed. Then he turned toward the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her to stand up. After he called the saints and the widows, he presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for many days with a man named Simon the Tanner. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ, a.k.a. also known as. There have been some pretty famous ones and some, maybe not so much. Do you know them? Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, okay. Leslie Lynch King. A.K.A. President Gerald Ford. Marshall Mathers, also known as Eminem. Yeah, we had one person know that. Archibald Leach. Cary Grant. Yeah, I heard Cary Grant back there. Richard Starkey, also known as Ringo Starr. Reginald Dwight. There we go. Uh, Ferdinand Lewis Alcindor. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Cassius Clay, there's the easy one, Muhammad Ali, Marion Morrison, okay, there's lots of them like that, and you might not know it, but there are at least two people I know in this congregation that have AKAs, also known as, and there's a whole bunch of them in the Bible, right, Abram, Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, Esau, Edom, Jacob, Israel, Daniel, oh, tough. Belteshazzar, <laughs> Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If I say them all together, you, you knew that one, right? There was a, an apostle, one of the apostles. He was called Nathanael, but the guys all called him Bartholomew. Another one was Levi. They called him Matthew. And then that one that they almost replaced Judas with, Joseph, a.k.a. Justice, also known as Barsabas. Well, here in chapter 9 of the God-inspired account that Dr. Luke records of the early New Testament church, we get all kinds of a.k.a., also known as, going on. Acts chapter 9 starts out with this really amazing conversion story of this guy that, that used to be a, a Jesus-hating, Christian-persecuting rabbi Pharisee by the name of Saul. But then he got that also known as Paul, the apostle. The Christians in that area went by the alias of the way. And they weren't trusting this Saul or Paul or whatever he said his name was. They were all afraid of him. So they wanted nothing to do with him until this, this fine young Christian man in their church, he, his parents named him Joseph, but everybody just called him Barnabas because that, in their language that means the encouraging one, the one who encourages. Well, he finally got Paul, Saul, introduced all these people and kind of got him assimilated into the whole group. And then we think, well, then it's going to go on because this book of Acts is going to be centered around the exploits of this Saul, a.k.a. Paul. But it's really not. As now God has Luke get us back on track. And this first part is really the, the rising of the New Testament church under the administration of those original 12 apostles. And... We see that it centers and focuses mostly on the ministry of another guy. He was named Simon at birth. Some people called him Cephas, a.k.a. 
Peter. Oh yeah, that guy with a different name to, to remind us of his transformation, right? That transformation from that impulsive, that, that, that bumbler, to being that really strong and competent leader of his Savior's church. A ministry in which now he depended completely on his Savior, Jesus, and his ministry actually showed great similarities with that ministry of Jesus, like we see in God's word for today, as here he and, and these followers of Christ were to keep God's mission going. So Peter, Cephas, Simon, whatever you want to call him, he happens to be in this small town by the name of Lydda. Okay, a.k.a. Al-Lid, or today it's also known as Lod. And it would be the first Bible place that anyone traveling to the Holy Land today would probably touch on because it's the place where Israel's international airport is. Anyways, the disciple Peter, the rock, he's there and he's visiting these newly missionized towns and villages, and he's also serving to try to open up some new fields for gospel outreach. And there, of course, like everything he was doing, in Jesus' name and with Jesus' power, it was having success, and he was getting to do some wonderful things, proclaiming the message of the kingdom of God and actually getting to heal people. There was this paralyzed guy by the name of Aeneas, and, and, and it, was, it was just like when Je Jesus was around because he preached his sermon and then the people bring him this, this paralyzed guy who's lying on this, this mat and Jesus says, Aeneas, get up, take your, bat, your mat with you and go. Go home. And just like when Jesus healed all those people, this Aeneas complied and he got up and he took that no longer needed sick bed with him. Now we're 35 verses in and over a little space, about nine miles, there's another town called Joppa. Jaffa, Tel Aviv, Yofa. It's, it's all, all the same thing. Kind of funny. It's the same place where Jonah had run away to because he didn't want to do mission work. Now this is where they're going to do mission work. But anyway, in Joppa, there's this female disciple. And this is the only place that it's used in the whole Bible. It's kind of an interesting word. It takes the word for disciple and makes a feminine out of it. This female disciple by the name of Dorcas, or some people called her Tabitha. And it's really the same thing, whether Aramaic, Greek, they both mean the same thing. They're both their word for a gazelle doe, emblem of grace and beauty. And this woman really was the emblem of grace and beauty as she engaged in just beautiful and gracious works of service and, and charitable deeds. And, and really, literally, it says here that this Dorcas, a.k.a. Tabitha, was full of good works and charitable, charitable deeds that she was keeping on doing. Well, until she, until she died. And then it started to really sink in to the church around. As they're washing her body, getting her ready for burial, but they put her in an upstairs room. They, they didn't usually do that. Back then, in that time, in that place, they would usually bury the people as fat, quick as possible, get them in the ground that same day if they, if they possibly could. But they put her in the upstairs room where there'd be some ventilation in case, in case she had to be there for a while, I suppose. And because Peter... Simon Cephas was in the area. They, they, they sent some men from the congregation to go and see if they could get him to come over. I don't know what they were expecting Peter to do or to, to be able to do, but, but Peter complied and he hustles over with them. And, and there again, we see things just like with Jesus' ministry, don't we? I mean, he just healed the paralyzed guy and proclaimed the kingdom of God. And then some people are coming, hurry, hurry, this, this, this person like Lazarus was dead. Or like that 12-year-old daughter of the, the synagogue ruler was dead. And, and so they have Peter come over and, and the people are mourning and crying, just like all those other scenes. They're grief-stricken as, as the, the widows that Tabitha had made these clothes for, they're just lining the path and, and weeping out loud and they can hardly console themselves in their grief as, as they're showing all the things that Dorcas, Tabitha, made for them, and, and the, the verb form is it's kind of unique, and, and the preposition, it makes me think that they were actually wearing these things that they were showing. Maybe it was like the only clothes they had, but they were showing off to, to Peter all these things that, that Dorcas had so kindly and generously made for them. Maybe it wasn't as flashy of a ministry as, as Peter's was, but it was just as definitely a ministry in service to her Jesus. Up to this day, probably no one else knew. I mean, the, these widows, yeah, they were all very appreciative, but I bet, I bet you hardly anyone else knew that she was even doing that. 
but God knew. Well, now he told us, so, so we, we all know. But, but anyway, Peter gets on the scene, and he throws everyone out of the room. And, and just like when Jesus raised that little girl from the dead, he prays first. And where Jesus had said, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. Peter says, Tabitha kum, Tabitha, get up. It just, he just changed only, only one letter. It's, it's remarkably similar to, to, to what Jesus had done, just one letter different. And, and, and notice how, how Luke is so precise in all this, right? He tells us that he turns to her body because she's not there anymore. He turns to her body, but he says, Dorcas and, and Tabitha, and, and and her spirit returns. She, come, she comes back, and now she's alive and well, and, and of course, word gets out, and of course, the word does what the word always does. And verse 42 says, so many people believed in the Lord. Again, j- just like with Jesus, isn't it? This isn't just some crazy coincidence. And this isn't just a, a, a bunch of people kind of deciding to, to get their act together to, to step up and, and do and talk and think and, and behave like, like how their Jesus did. No, this is, this is because it is Jesus. It, it's, it's all Jesus. See, something else, all these people, these people with their aliases or these people who are being healed or raised or, or changed from hell-bound persecutor into, into child of God, best missionary this world has ever seen, they had something else in common. What they had in common was that previously they had been absolutely unable to help themselves. And so absolutely unable to help themselves, not a single one of them even was able to ask for help for themselves. It wasn't that the Jesus-hating Pharisee had all of a sudden decided to ask his Lord and Savior into his spiritually dead heart. It wasn't like that that paralyzed Aeneas guy had, had, had just kind of really gritted his teeth and, and dedicated himself to making those dead legs walk. And it wasn't like this beautiful seamstress lady who had assumed room temperature now all of a sudden decided to suck it up and, and get over that low energy level and, and, and kind of will those, those brain neurons to start refiring again. All of it was God. This was She came back because her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is true and very God, who has has power over everything, even death itself, and can even reverse death itself, and promises to do that for all his people forever in his heaven. And we know this woman knew this because she knew her Jesus. She knew this Jesus who had paid for all her sins, this true God who had come and lived in human flesh, in human history, in in this space and in this time, and and had done all those things that we were required to do for God and never did or could or would, and he did them all for us, and then to pay for all the times we haven't and couldn't and didn't and won't. He paid for them all by the perfect sacrifice of himself on the cross. She knew that. And she knew that his amazing rising from the dead was proof positive that everything was okay, everything was paid for, that he really did control everything and would use it for the good of his people and the keeping of all his promises. Yeah, Dorcas, a.k.a. Tabitha, she was a good person. What a nice lady. But not good enough and nice enough to overcome her illness. Not good enough to be able to stave off the wages of sin, which is death. None of us could, and that's why we needed Jesus to be that for all of us. Because even though it looked like this woman's legacy was outside the door with those beautiful handmade clothes and materials, all those good deeds that those people were testifying to, that wasn't it. That wasn't her legacy. Her legacy came to her from her Jesus. The only one who can actually even say what is a good deed or a good work and what isn't. Oh, we, I know we all think we can, and we think we could recognize that or we'll know one when we see it, but that is not the case. As God tells us in Hebrews 11, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to do a good deed without faith. Just because something looks nice to us or, or we happen to like it, that doesn't make it a good deed. Romans 14, 23 adds, for everything that does not proceed from faith is sin. But wherever the Holy Spirit has planted that thing called faith, that believes in Jesus, there there's perfect forgiveness for all our sins. Even those ones that taint our our alleged or supposed good deeds. 
And there's the Easter proof that, that we will rise again just as, as Jesus has promised. And, and there is power and there is love and, and there is the ability and there is there's what makes us like Jesus. Yeah, we saw a lot of acting like Jesus and ministry like Jesus and saying like Jesus. But no, this faith that God gives us makes us like Jesus. So that God sees us exactly as perfect in his judgment, in his eyes, as he sees his one and only son, Jesus. There's that, that beautiful, encouraging, all grace passage from Ephesians 2. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God so that no one could ever boast. But wait, there's more, right? Like the commercials on, on TV. There's more. As the next verse says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. God has shaped and molded the lives of all of his people to, to be able to have meaning and purpose. And our lives are, are full of purpose and meaning. It, you know, what's your purpose in life? Do you know? What is it that, that you get up in the morning to do? What is your purpose? Because I, I don't know if you know this or not, but not having a meaning or not having a purpose in life, it stinks. It's not very fun at all. It's very empty. It's a drag. And if you don't believe me, you could, you could ask any grade school child on summer vacation who has nothing to do. It's terrible. But we don't have to know that because we have a God who gives us meaning, a God who gives us purpose, the purpose of being able to live for the God who has saved us eternally. With whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever abilities that, that, that we have being combined together in this united ministry, to serve our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his all for us. Whether ours seem to be such magnificent, grand gifts, or they just seem to be more normal and mundane, or, or whether even they seem to be not quite as sharp as the ones I used to have 20 years ago, it doesn't matter. They're all the same purpose of loving and serving the one who loved and served us so much. Right, those who know that. Those who have that, they show it by their lives. Like Dorcas, a.k.a. Tabitha. Saul, a.k.a. Paul. Simon, a.k.a. Peter. And you, a.k.a. Also known it. Did you catch it in the text? It was in there. I, I, I maybe read it a little fast, but it says right after Dorcas, Tabitha is brought to life, after he called the saints, he presented them to her alive. They presented her to them alive. Did you catch it there? You're also known as the saints. These are the people from her congregation, the other believers, the people just like us, the people, the people who believed in Jesus. And this is the glowing testimony from God himself. You are also known as saints. Believe it. Enjoy it. Celebrate it. Live it. Till he calls you home for good. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to confess together the Christian faith we share. We do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you please stand as you're able? <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.